Hey everyone, I'm going to do something a little different today. It's currently about 8 a.m., rainy morning, and we are in the mountains of Mexico. We're going to be pulling triples. See them there, maybe. With 70,000 pounds of lumber behind us. On a fairly squirrely route back to town. I'm going to be driving the Kenworth K100 by Mr. Overfloater with a Caterpillar 3408 V8 engine with 400 horsepower. We've got a 15-speed transmission, which I will talk a little more about later. It has the uh, horseshoe-shaped shift pattern, which I'll show you. Beautiful, beautiful brown truck. Let's have a look at the outside here. So there's our triples. There's our brown truck. So let's have a look at the route. This is it. So we're driving this part. This is the Mexico Extremo add-on to the Viva Mexico map, and I will put download links to those in the description below. If you zoom in on this route here, like there's a lot of hairpin turns. Hello, cat. A lot of this is on the edge of a mountain, on very sharp drop-offs. There's a ton of potential here, especially if there's traffic for some collisions, for some really tight turns, and especially with these triples, I'm not sure that I'm going to get around some of them very well. Our engine is a little small for the amount of weight we have, but hopefully with the transmission and the final drive ratio we have, it'll work out okay. A little bit of careful driving maybe. We'll see. So it's only, as it says here, in the top 254 miles. But with the speed limit being something like 25 to 40 kilometers per hour, that's kilometers, uh, it's going to be a 17 hour drive. And for the most part, we'll be fairly close to that speed limit, I hope. So hopefully that's an accurate estimate, but it's still going to take us all day and it'll probably be dark by the time we get in. So let's get moving. Start up the truck. Beautifully modeled truck. Get some wipers on. Lights because of the rain. Alright, so as I mentioned, 15 speed, so we're going to deep production one, and I'll talk a little more about why that's not entirely accurate in a minute. But for now, let's get moving. I think this is going to be something of an interesting drive. I have been down this road a couple of times in the past and it's usually not so bad, but I'm also usually not loaded up with triples that weigh as much as these. The last time I attempted this road I had doubles, weighing about 40, 45,000 pounds, so <clears throat> it was a much easier drive and I didn't have any trouble really, but we will see. A big part of the difficulty of this particular path is traffic. If there's a lot of it, it can be really challenging to get around some of those corners where you need to use the entire road because your trailer is so long. But if there isn't much traffic and it's really light, which I'm hoping for, then it's not so bad. Because you can effectively use the whole road to your advantage, so I'm already dragging trailers across the grass there a little bit. Alright, so we are crawling up this. I think this is a bad omen for the way things are going to go. Because I am reluctant to get out of this gear right now. I think we might be in for a bad time. But we're going to get up here to this sign where the road starts to level out. Attempt to uh, shift up a few gears and get some speed. So right now we're going five miles per hour. I 
So a big part of the reason I'm attempting this at all is because the transmission I have behind me has 463 rear gears. Alright, let's try a shift. Okay. Barely. So there's a single fixed ring gear inside your differential, and it's only got a it's got a very specific ratio that never changes, unlike in your transmission where you've got a whole bunch of different gears, and you can select the one you want. The one in your final drive in your differential multiplies by whatever gear you're in in the transmission, and it stays the same always. So that's something you spec out when you build the truck in the first place. You choose a final drive ratio you think will be appropriate for the kind of work you want to do, the higher the ratio, so above 3, going up to, you know, 350, 350, 373, 410, 463, even 5 to 1. Really. Wow, yeah, this is going to be a tough drive. So the higher the ratio, the, the more easily you'll be able to start from a stop, or the more easily you'll be able to climb a hill. The engine won't have to work as hard to pull larger loads at slower speeds, but you will have worse fuel economy on the highway because your engine will rev higher in those later gears. So it's a bit of a trade-off. If you're going to be over the road, which is what this game was intended around, then something like a 323 is where you want to be. Because you're going to get really good fuel mileage, you're going to get a nice low engine RPM when you're cruising on the highway. It's going to be very fuel efficient, and if you're not having to pull up major hills or um, very heavy loads, then it will be just fine. So that's what comes with the base game. Now once you start getting into mods, especially when you look at older engines that have different torque curves, different horsepower curves, less power in general, the base game transmissions stop being sufficient. And I think that's where a lot of people run into issues when they install these older engines and then they use a modern era transmission with a 323 final drive and they can't get started on hills. Or getting started in general is just an absolute slog. Well, we're ignoring your stop sign, boys. Sorry. Because I'm afraid I won't get going again. Even as it is, I'm rapidly trying to catch gears because I'm crawling up this hill. So forget what I said about, you know, being close to the speed limit. We are half the speed limit right now. And falling. Yeah, I'm below where I want to be, but I'm at the apex of this hill, so we're okay. down the hill. We're not going to pick up too much speed. This is quite a heavy load. Holy. Um, so anyway, so with the older engines, anything uh, 1970s era, 1960s era, they have very different horsepower and torque curves. They don't have a whole lot of power at low RPM, not like the new engines do. You really need to rev them up. You need to keep them above 1500 for a lot of these engines, and they run their horsepower curve is almost a linear increase all the way up to the red line in some of these engines. So the higher you're revving them, in some cases, the better. This one is happiest between about 1400 and 1700. But to drive these engines more effectively, you need to pair them with uh, a period correct transmission, or at least with proper final drive ratio so that you can get going off the line or up a hill when the engines don't have a whole lot of power at low speed, and I am really cutting that line hard, but I don't have much 
choice. So this transmission is uh, its actually built from a compound transmission, so a twin stick. It's a Spicer six-speed main box with a four-speed auxiliary box. And the way that works is the main box has gears one, two, three, four, five, and six, and the auxiliary box has low, underdrive, direct drive, and overdrive. And the way you would shift that basically would be to start in one low, so first gear in the main box, low in the auxiliary box, and then go from there to one under, and then one direct, and then one over. Now the fun thing is, once you get to one overdrive, you would think that logically the next gear to go to would be second gear low, but that would actually be the wrong direction for ratio. There's some overlap there, and the low gear is so low that it would be like downshifting not up shifting. So you have skip over your low gear once you get out of first and you go from first overdrive to second under. And second direct, second overdrive. And third under, third direct, third over. And then when you get to fourth gear it changes a little bit again. I believe in this one you can still use four under and four direct and then you skip four over and go to five under, five direct, five over, and then I think you skip six low, six under, and go straight to six direct, or maybe even six over. I forget the exact ratios off the top of my head, and we are going way too fast. I'm gonna slow it down a little. But if you're listening to the gears I'm calling out here, where we skipped a whole bunch. It's a whole bunch of combinations of gears that we are not using, and that's kind of the way that compound transmissions work. They provide a whole bunch of gears so that you can get up the hills you need or pull the heavy loads you need, but they also have a lot of overlap because they're straight multipliers. So what I did was I took those two transmissions, I mapped out all 24 forward speeds, so 6 in the main, 4 in the auxiliary, 6 times 4 is 24. Mapped out all the gears and then looked at the ones you actually use, and there's only 15 of them. So because I only have one shifter, I don't have a second shift knob, it's not very convenient to drive a 24 speed transmission with one stick because you just don't have that many positions to select. That was a wide corner, but I had no choice. And again, I'm lucky there's no traffic. Hey, there is some traffic, but I think he might be stuck or something. Hmm. Well, so far, so good with the traffic. Anyways, I took, I mapped out all 24 gears, and then I mapped out the 15 that you actually use in regular driving, and I removed all of the other ones. And with 15 gears, I can then map those to a regular old Eaton Fuller 15-speed transmission pattern. So that gives me five gears in deep reduction, and then gears one, two, three, four, five, and then I flip the range select up, and I get six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's sort of an abomination of a transmission, but given the current hardware I have to work with, it works quite well. I would like to add a second shifter to my setup, and then I could run the actual 24-speed transmission. But they're expensive, and especially for the pattern that the main box has in this particular Spicer setup, you need something with eight gates, which means you need the Thrustmaster Theta. It's the only one that I'm aware of that has eight shift gates. And it's the only one that'll work for the actual shift pattern that transmission has. But the problem with that is it's $200 Canadian, so... And it never seems to go on sale. I've been watching it for quite some time and it has not gone on sale. Quite disappointed. Because I don't have $200 to throw at a shifter. Alright, we're going to take it slow around here. We're using the brake saver. That's that whining sound that sounds a bit like a bus transmission. So the CAT 3408, it has a fueling system that is incompatible with a traditional Jake brake. That's going slow. So it could not be fit with a Jake brake. So instead, what CAT did was they put a hydraulic retarder on it.
me. That was close. Uh, they put a hydraulic retarder on, kind of like a um, torque converter in a modern automatic in a passenger car. It's a fluid retarder. Well, I still have my wipers on that I don't need. Go me. And it makes that sound like a bus transmission. And a lot of people have asked uh, for a jake brake to be added to this engine, but it never had one. It was never capable of fitting one. It was capable of fitting an aftermarket exhaust brake, but I've never been able to find a clean audio sample of what that sounded like. Otherwise, I could add that as an optional add-on. Uh, that's not good. Missed our shift. But luckily, I think we're in an okay place. We're right at the top of a hill here. Headed down, should be okay to get moving. So I am shifting, I am uh, shifting without my clutch. I'm floating my gears, which is personal preference because I could be double clutching, but I'd rather not. And floating works really well, but if I miss a gear and I can't catch it in time, I often end up having to just start over, come to a complete stop, start over. Let's see if we can get up another gear. Yep, all right. So this engine is happiest, like I've been keeping it around 1500 or at least trying to. Uh, the torque curve, torque curve peaks at 1100 and stays that way until 1400 rpm so it's a fairly wide torque band but your horsepower is quite low until that point so you won't really be able to get moving very quickly if you're down below 1400 rpm your horsepower takes a steady climb from there up until about 1900 I want to say and then it falls off rather sharply at about 2000 so you never want to go beyond 2000 and really the best place to drive with any engine is where you can maximize both values horsepower and torque along their curves so you want to pick an rpm high enough that you still have torque before it falls off but also high enough that you picked up horsepower and uh, before yeah before it falls off as well so in that engine, or in this engine, that's around 1400 to 1750 or so. It's really where you want to be. So I'll time my shifts. I'll usually come up to about 1800, 1900, and then shift so that I land in the next gear at about 1500 RPM and have room to fall down to 1400 and still climb. And you can hear it really start to bog down when it gets below 14. It starts groaning, whining. It's not a happy engine below there. It's got plenty of torque, like it'll crawl. It'll be perfectly fine to crawl up a hill, but it won't go very fast. This is really something, hey? I shouldn't be working the turbo that hard. I don't feel like I have a whole lot of choice right now. This truck mod was made by Mr. Overfloater, and it is absolutely gorgeous. It is one of my favorite truck mods out there, along with, it's like right up there with the quality of the stuff made by Harbin. So that's the latest, um, that would be like your Mac R, or your FLB, or the recent W990, which he worked on. This truck is beautifully modeled, it performs well, things are animated properly, I have no glitches with it. It's period correct. The amount of detail and care that went into it, like it's got options, it's got nice textures, it has everything you'd be looking for in a mod. Whether it, or even an official DLC, like this would pass for official DLC in my opinion, because it is done so well. I really 
really need to shift, but you see me running the engine too high there because I keep thinking that I'm going to hit a hill here and it's going to bog me down and I'm going to be glad I stayed in that gear, but then it doesn't quite happen. I, you know, despite the fact this is only a 400 horsepower engine and I've got a ton of weight behind me, I do forget that it's uh, quite powerful, especially with this transmission behind it. so far so good with the triples I think as long as I don't miss any more gears we should be all right traffic has been all right none of the turns have been too crazy the rain has stopped beautiful day all right so let's talk a little about my hardware setup here so the webcam is an old Microsoft life cam studio special but it does do 1080p 30 fps on old usb 2. i've had it for years it works fine i like it i should probably upgrade but i mean it works the wheel is a logitech g920 this is actually the second wheel because the first one that i got started chirping after a few months of use And now this one, after I've had it for about a year and a half, I guess, since uh, Logitech replaced it, and it's starting to do the same thing, so I guess it just must be a thing that these all do. Aside from that, the wheel is fine. I've been pretty happy with it. I haven't had issues really to speak of. It's worked quite well. I use it for this, for a set of Corsa, for Formula One, for different games, and it's been really good through all of them. Speed bumps. I did. And I'm just coasting now because I've missed the gear. I'm currently trying to find it. There we go. Okay. Fifth gear. That's scary because the truck is basically in runaway mode at that point and you're searching for the right gear and if you don't know exactly what gear to be in at any given speed and RPM, it can be trouble because you really don't have great ways to slow the truck down at that point. You've got your brakes, and that's it. Okay. So this is quite the hill. So we are in third gear. second gear. Um, oh, first gear, sorry. I'm already forgetting my own shift layout here. And I'm not sure we're going to make it up this hill. I mean, that's, see, this is what I mean about that torque. At 1100 RPM, you've got peak torque, so you can crawl. You just won't go very fast. second gear. Sorry car, I'm taking this turn a little wide. Okay, so back to hardware now that we're sort of recovered here. Uh, the shifter is, well, the base shifter is the Logitech shifter that comes with or you buy with the G920 sold separately. And the shift knob is a Tech Affliction Mega Shifter. It's not their Road King version, which is a genuine Eaton Fuller knob. It's just the um, World World America, I think it's called. But it has been fine. I've had it for a year and a half. I use it constantly. I have never had a single issue with it. So I, would, I got it on time. I got it exactly when I was told I would get it. 
I would highly recommend it if you're looking for one of these and you think you can you think you can handle the price tag of over a hundred bucks and a little bit of a wait time it was well worth it I've used it constantly and it's held up very well and it's been a great product I'm quite happy with it the head tracking I'm using is a natural point track IR5 I've had it for several years it's a gift and it has also held up really well. I've been very pleased with that. I use it for DCS, I use it for this, I use it for all kinds of games. It's also expensive at $150, but again, it, it's such a difference, especially for a game like this where you need to have that situational, situational awareness and be able to look out the sides and see what's coming, see what's around the corner. And maybe in this game you can get away without it, but in flight simulators, it is a game changer. I couldn't play DCS without head tracking anymore. So if you're on the fence about it, you don't have to buy a track IR. You can make your own, or you can buy something like a track hat or the ED tracker. There's a whole bunch of different options out there for different prices. Find something that fits your budget. You can also build your own if you're willing to just buy some LEDs and solder them up to a battery pack. That's a good way to go. You can use the PS3i camera. You can do that all for 25 bucks. But it takes time and it's going to be a bit ugly. So, you know, whatever you like. So we're using that brake saver to try to Keep her RPM around 1500 as we come down the hill, 1600. Maximum is 40 kilometers an hour, and that's exactly what we're doing, so that's awesome. And I'm just coasting at the moment, letting the engine sort of manage my speed, tapping a retarder here and there. shift, I think. Let's go up into six. This looks like quite a corner. Take it really wide. There's nobody coming. And see, this is where the head tracking is so useful. Because I can just look around that corner as I go and see that there's nobody coming. We're going back down to five. keep the trailers in our lane which is tough when the road is narrow you don't want to go off the edge of the cliff luckily there's a barrier even though there's not traffic coming it's something I try to not get in the habit of I like to stay in my own lane because you never know when someone's going to come flying around that corner and you're not going to see them Speed bump. So normally I would do this road the other direction. So there's a lot more uphill than there is downhill. So this is interesting. I haven't actually done the downhill direction yet. some very different concerns coming down the hill. Right now, we're speeding the engine, just about. You really, ideally, want to pick a gear that will hold the truck and the trailer behind it at a reasonable, acceptable speed. So you shouldn't need brake, you shouldn't need retarder or jig brake. You shouldn't need to use anything except let the engine control its own speed. So I'm currently in fourth gear, and that's working out fairly well. But if you pick the wrong gear, you 
pick too low of a gear and it starts over to over speed. And then you're stuck using your brakes and your, your retarder and whatever else you might have to try to slow the truck down and wear out all those things as well. You especially don't want to use your brakes because the brake fade, as they heat up, they get less and less effective. And that can be a killer coming down a hill if your brakes just suddenly don't work when you need them. So if I can make it all the way down the hill without touching my brakes once, that's the best case scenario. It's really quite a good looking map. I don't remember if it's always been this nice or if it's been improved on more recently. Alright, so I'm not entirely sure which way I'm going here. I think I'm going to go left. I'm pretty sure I want to go left to continue on this path, yes. I need to come up a gear, I think. Maybe not. Well, so far so good. So one of the fun things about these older trucks is that the GPS didn't exist. Which way I'm supposed to go? I think this way. Let's try this way. Oh, I think I picked the wrong way. I think I skipped over all the hard part over there. Well, that's okay. I should have looked at the map. Now, that's kind of what I was saying is these older trucks didn't have GPS built in and depending on the era it's not like you could just buy one they didn't exist so you had physical paper maps and if you wanted to stop and get directions you had to have the map first of all and then pull over somewhere and look at it so when I'm driving these trucks I try to abide by that but I'm not looking at the map unless I'm pulled over somewhere Normally I would spend a little more time memorizing my turns so that I know where I'm going. Here's a sharp corner. No choice but to cut that one a bit. So I think this is now back to the Viva Mexico map, or at least it will be soon, because this is a whole lot easier to drive on, the roads are much wider, curves are a little easier to handle. that yellow so that my trailers have enough room to stay in my lane. 60 kilometers an hour maximum. Well, I don't think we're going anywhere near that. pretty fast right now. I shouldn't be moving this quick with this kind of load behind me. And this is not going to be a good gear if I suddenly have to go up a hill. But I think it might be okay for now. Try to go a little bit 
wider and not cut the corner so hard. That was all right. So we don't need lights on, do we? So this is really quite the map. I would definitely recommend it to anyone looking for a bit of a challenge over the base game. So the roads in the base game, especially if you just have like New Mexico and Arizona. I went the wrong way with that shift. That's what I did. But if you just have things like New Mexico, Arizona, the roads are pretty dull. They're pretty straight, level, wide. Not much happens. You're not going to get anything like this. When you get into Oregon and Washington, there are some logging roads that resemble this, but nothing of this length or nothing to this extreme. And I think that that's something I would like to see more of in this game. There's more challenging routes to take or more interesting routes to take for those players who are interested in that sort of thing. So even though we got off the more extreme path, this is still quite interesting. Fourth gear. Random house. It's really quite interesting how different truck sim can be with a few mods. If you compare the base game with new trucks on sort of easier roads, lots more powerful engines, and then you look at something like what we're doing here with an older truck and an older engine and an older transmission on more challenging terrain, and it's a very different game. A lot of people say that they play truck sim so that they can listen to podcasts or watch Netflix on the other monitor or uh, learn something while they drive or just relax and this kind of drive is a whole lot more engaging it requires a lot more of your attention because one mistake can have you stranded on a hill with no way to move forward and traffic behind you so at least for me I find that a whole lot more interesting pretty too, especially with the new DirectX 11 stuff. Really, really good looking game. So I'm really impressed by how well the 400 horsepower engine has been doing with 71,000 pounds of lumber behind it. It has actually been relatively problem free. I catch my gears when I'm shifting, things go all right. The triples are reasonably well behaved. how I don't think that caused any damage to my truck. Oh, 1%. Okay. Oops. Are we still... No, we are. Never mind. We are still on the extreme up path. Okay. looking at <clears throat> I was looking to see if the truck was damaged and well the map came with it so 
<clears throat> so much for only looking at the map when I'm stopped, I guess. This will be an interesting corner. Try to keep the trailers in my lane. Eh, could have been better. So the speedometer and the tack that you see on the screen, those are provided by an ETS2 telemetry server. You can Google it, you'll find the GitHub page where there's the download and the SES forum page. The theme I'm using is the Kenworth T680 theme, which you'll also find in that forum thread if you search for it. It's my favorite of the ones available. And then what I did was I took a screenshot of the dash in my browser and I cropped out just the two gauges I wanted and used those images as masks in OBS. So in open broadcasting software, you uh, load up a browser source, point it at the telemetry server's page, and then apply an image mask filter. It's getting dark. Which cuts out everything except for the gauge you want. And so I have one for the tachometer and one for the speedometer. And then I just put them on the top of the screen. And I find them nice when I'm watching these videos because it's sometimes, especially with head tracking and different things or external cams, it can be a challenge for the viewer to be able to see what your current speed and RPM is. Because I'm looking around, I'm not actually watching that right now, I'm not even, it's not even on my screen, but you can still see it at the top. So if you're curious how fast I'm going or how fast my engine is turning at any given time, it's there and I like that. I can't see it as an overlay in my game, it is strictly in OBS, but I can glance over at the second monitor and see it if I want to, so depending on your setup, you might want to put that on a tablet in front of you. I've heard from a few people who, they put that on a tablet mounted directly below or above their main monitor, and they put the dash, the ETS2 telemetry server dash up on that, and then they drive in the external cam, so they drive like this the whole way and they can just look up and I'm gonna crash. Oh, no, okay, we're okay. All right. So they can drive like that the whole way because they prefer to drive in the external cam and they can still have their gauge cluster and everything they need on a screen nearby. So it's a really useful tool, I highly recommend it. actually know where I'm delivering to in town, so I'm going to have to find a place here to pull over. I think I want to go... I actually don't know. I think I need to follow the road a little more. I'll have to pull over soon and have a look at the map and see where we're going. Because now we're out of the mountains. We're off the Extremo path and we're back on the Viva Mexico, as far as I know. Don't need our brights on, we're gonna blind someone. Oh, there we're going. Mazatlan. Taking a right. Even a hill like this, I'm kind of hesitant to have any speed coming across the top of it because I can see the truck's going to accelerate all by itself quite rapidly. And then the brake saver will slow it down. All right, we're going to have a quick glance at the map, at the light. So we're taking a right turn, we're going to go left across the highway. We're going to take an exit here and go across into town and then follow it to just before Haddock Shipyard. We're going to take a right towards a gas station into the home store. Okay. So right, left, right. Let's see if we can do it. I don't know if I'm allowed to turn right on a red light in Mexico.
but we're going to assume that we can. Nice and wide here. Shifting, I'm timing my shifts so that I end up in the next gear at, well, I skipped a gear there. Me too. At 1500. 1500 RPM. That's kind of where I want to be. Taking the exit to the right. This is going to be kind of interesting because with 70,000 pounds, I really don't want to skip too many gears. And I don't really start in first, I start in deep reduction pretty much every time. So I'm rowing through six to ten gears depending on how far I'm able to go before the next light. Alright, we are turning to the right up here. Go around an S curve memory serves. And we're losing it. When RPM starts to fall like that, it's a good time to shift. should have been counting intersections. Well, we'll take a chance. We'll go straight here. And we'll take a right at the next one. Because I know that the Haddock shipyard is still a little ways up the road. So this is kind of the fun part, at least for me, of not driving with a map or a GPS, is I'm paying attention to landmarks and corners and buildings and different things and trying to learn my way around the actual towns. So there's the shipyard up there, so we're going to take a right here. Ugh. You actually learn your way around the towns a little bit. Hello, Mr. Bus. Promise not to hit you much. Should be okay. Looks alright to me. And I find that a whole lot more engaging, learning my way around the town, than just following the red line on the screen. Yep, and here is the fuel station. So we're going to take a right, and we're headed to the home store. Right turn. 
turn, a little wide. Again, take more room than you think you need. Just look how close that trailer is. Back there. If you have the road, use it. Hold up traffic if you have to. And we're at the home improvement store is here, so then where am I going in? That looks like just up here. So we're gonna move left. That'll be it there. turn stop on the X all right we did it where do you want it back there we can do that I am NOT brave enough to attempt to back up a triple in a space like this especially um, because this is an a train I'll show you what I mean by that so I can zoom in here this actually works really well so You've got a trailer and then it's got a hitch on the back and then you have so there's the hitch right there and then there's a little dolly this part here and this dolly attaches to your uh, hitch ball and then it's got a fifth wheel on it a fifth wheel hitch and then there's a kingpin on this trailer that snaps into it so you have a pivot point here at the hitch ball and you have another pivot point here right here and a really real so this is like a really short separate trailer of it on its own and you have these two pivot points really close together, which makes it really, really challenging to back that up because it's going to move left and right very quickly. And then if you go back further, so okay, so that was the second and third trailer. Now if you go closer, there's the exact same thing here. So you've got the first trailer, uh, and it's got a hitch on the back, and it's got a dolly, and then the dolly has a fifth wheel hitch right here. So you've got a pivot point here. So that's one, two, three, four, five pivot points. So when you start backing up, you're managing five pivot points. Think about how difficult it is for the average person to back up a single boat, like a 14 foot speed boat or a 53 foot trailer. Now that only has one pivot point. Now I have five of them. It's quite a challenge. If this were a B double, the difference would be this trailer would extend out further and it wouldn't have a hitch with a separate dolly. It would just extend out further and it would be rigid here and have another um, fifth wheel hitch behind it. So you have fewer pivot points. So you'd have one here at the truck, you'd have one here where the second trailer hooked up and you'd have one here where the third trailer hooked up. So three total pivot points instead of five. It's much easier to manage. I am not skilled enough, nor dumb enough, to attempt to back up five pivot points. So instead, we're just gonna come around here, take a nice wide turn, think you need. Cut that one awfully close. And we're just going to bring it in here. trailer 256 miles in 15 hours and seven minutes and we did it we're on time we weren't late I am actually very surprised that we weren't late I guess the speed limit on that road is accurate to the actual speed you'll end up going so that's good awesome well thank you very much for watching and maybe we'll do some more of these in the future cheers